About four weeks ago, we started a series talking about a subject that in church world we call law and grace. Um, before coming into the church, I never used that, that phrase about law and grace. I understood the concept of it, but I, I never heard the term law and grace. I, I heard more stuff about good and evil. Uh, I heard about good and bad and that, that whole kind of thing. And I don't know where you are in a relationship with God. I don't know what your religious background is this morning. But regardless of what your viewpoint is about God, all of us in our minds, in our lives, we have a sense about right and wrong. And, and we're taught from early on that if there's a God or whatever deity that you, you sacrifice to or worship or honor or this higher power, whatever it is, there is this sense inside of us that the harder we work and the better we try to be, that this higher power, this God, this deity, whatever God we serve, will like us more. There's this sense inside of us, and we learn it early on because if you came up through the ranks of Sunday school, you were in that Sunday school classroom where the teacher had this calendar on the wall, and there was a picture of Jesus at the top holding some sheep, and then a bunch of little lines underneath, and your name was written there. And every time you came to Sunday school, you got a check mark. And when you got so many check marks in a row, you got a gold star. And you maybe learned early on that you were not as good as some of the other kids were because for whatever reason, you didn't get to Sunday school as often. And so the other kids had gold stars, but you didn't have a gold star. And so we learn early on that if you want to earn the favor and get up in the rankings and have some standing and stature with God and authority and religious authority, that you got to be good because the better you are, the more God loves you. And so we started out with this whole premise a couple of weeks ago. We talked about something called grace. Now, we don't, we don't talk about law and grace if we're on the outside or the fringes of Christianity. People in the workplace, you're going to go to work tomorrow. Uh, maybe, maybe you're a floor hand. You're out there on the floor talking to one of the other guys, and you're grabbing some drilling pipe, and there's all kinds of liquids all over the place. Hey, what do you think about law and grace? What? I mean, that'd be a weird conversation on the rig, wouldn't it? You know, but they all understand the concept of good and evil. They, they, they know that we're supposed to be good, and they understand that we're not supposed to do bad stuff, that there's laws, there's rules in place, and they understand that what we learned in the first week, we talked about this, is there's something that God offers to us called grace. And the amazing thing about grace is that you, you can't get more of it by working for it. It doesn't matter how good you try to be, you don't get more grace than somebody else does. God just offers you grace. It's an incredible thing about the heart of God. He just offers us grace because without grace, we wouldn't have any hope. And then, and then the flip side of that whole thing, we understand, we understand at the same time there's, there's rules. And we talked about law. And one thing that the Bible is very clear about is that we're, we're good at sinning. If you're not good at sinning, look at your neighbor. They are. I mean, we're just really good at sinning. We know how to sin really, really well. And we learn it early on. Nobody has to teach us how to sin. I could take you on a field trip up the stairs to our nursery, and you could peer inside the door at those little babies, those beautiful little babies. And something happens to those little babies, and pretty soon they learn how to be sinners right in our nursery, in our church. I don't know. They're not learning it from you. They must be learning it from us. So we learned that whole thing about law and grace. And we learned that we're sinners. And without grace, we, we have no hope. And then, so we talked about this vertical relationship that we have with God about law and grace. And then last week, Pastor Dan so wonderfully introduced grace on more of a horizontal plane and how we relate to one another. Did a great job. And we're going to kind of enter into that as we look at law and grace a little bit more. We're going to finish out the series as we talk about this a little bit more. And what we want to do this morning is define for us, where is the line between law and grace? How do we find that line? How do we know, how do we know that we're living in such a way that we're okay with people and we're okay with God? How do we define that line? How can I go to bed? How can I lay my pillow, my head on the pillow at night and just know that everything is good between me and God and one another? Where is the line? Because it seems like it's always changing. It seems like the law, that law and grace line is always changing. And for sure, for sure, we know what this is like in the home. Because you know what? Uh, this happened, it goes on with your kids. Mom and dad, you have kids. Uh, you, maybe you had parents. How many in here have ever had parents? Raise your hand. So, okay, that's good. If you didn't raise your hand, I'm wondering. Right, okay. I was in a test tube. No, I just, anyway. So, um, 
You knew this early on as a, as a kid, didn't you? You'd grown up at home, and you asked mom and dad, hey, mom, dad, can I go over to my friend's house and spend the night and eat supper and yada, yada? Sure, go ahead, out the door. The next time you asked for the very same thing, mom and dad responded to you like you just shot the family pet. What are you doing asking? No, there's no way you can do blah, 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 and you got a lecture and the whole thing, and, and you're all confused because last time it was okay, this time it's not. And here's what we learn about you and me and law and grace and this whole thing, that law and grace and kind of the rules change depending upon uh, our mood. You ever notice this? Because you knew this as a kid growing up. You knew when to ask dad to borrow the car, didn't you? You knew how to schmooze mom to get special favors. And you knew when not to ask, didn't you? Because you, even though the line wasn't drawn at home, you kind of got a feel for where it was. And that line between law and grace tended to shift depending on mom and dad's mood. (laughs) You just know this. There's students in here going, I wish I could elbow my mom. She needs to hear this. Like, right? So anyway, and so we think about this with God, too. We, we just think, well, the rules are always changing. And I'm new to church, and I'm new to Christianity, and what are the rules, and what does God expect, and how can I know that I'm in the right relationship with Him? And, and that's where we're going to go today, because we, we think that that line changes all the time. And I'm going to share with you some scripture today that if you, if you and I would implement what we're about to read, it would answer the question for us every time the question arose in our minds as to, How do I know how to handle these circumstances? How do I know how to handle stuff in my marriage right now? The argument with my kid, the relationship that I'm in, uh, a struggle with a coworker, the feelings I have about myself on the inside. If we, we're going to look at some scripture in just a moment in Romans chapter 13. If you brought a Bible today, you want to go to the book of Romans. We're going to go to Romans chapter 13 today. Uh, Romans was written by a guy named Paul. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. And he wrote this. This was a letter, not a book. This was a letter that Paul wrote to a bunch of Christians that lived in the city of, anybody want to guess? Rome, the front row always gets it. That's good. So he wrote this letter to a bunch of Christians in the, in, in the city of Rome, <clears throat> the same Rome that you, you see today and still there. And he wrote really into kind of the clash of two different cultures. This is an incredible thing. So uh, Christianity is brand new. I want you to go back in time with me. Christianity is brand new. Now, the first converts to Christianity were Jews. Jews had more than 600 laws that they had to abide by, laws that God established. And in order to go and worship in the temple, you had to obey the laws. There were certain rituals and laws that you had to go through. So now when they come into this relationship with God, they're thinking, well, we still have to obey the law in order to have the favor of God. God. Obey God's laws to have favor of God. So there's certain things that you do and don't do, and God loves you. And then on the other side of that, you had Gentiles, Gentiles who came out of the most pagan, heathen, hedonistic kind of background, and they came to faith in Christ, and they're like, wow, this is awesome. We can do anything we want, and God still loves us. And so now you had these two cultures coming into the church, and some said, no, you got to obey the rules to be right with God, and others said, look, you can do anything you want, and God still loves you. And so into this whole culture and climate, but Paul, Paul starts to write. And Paul writes things that are very personal to us in Romans 13 and 14. Because let's, let's be honest, you know what? When it comes to law and grace or just rules, period, you, you, know, you know who I like best? You know what kind of people in the world I like best? Sarah, I like the people that agree with me. I just, I can give a lot of grace to people that agree with me. If you have the same ideals that I have, if you like the same football team that I like, if you like the same foot, the the same pizza that I like, if you agree with me doctrinally, I'll give you tons and tons of grace. But if you're a Vikings fan, there's law, baby law. I'm just telling you, if you don't agree with my ideals, if you don't agree with the way I think, it's law. I'm just willing to put the law right out there. So that's just the, 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 the natural propensity for any of us. We, we, we'll give grace to people that think like us, but if they're not like us in culture, skin color, ethnicity, background, religious beliefs, oh boy, you just watch. <laughs> and some of us love the law. We'll hide behind the law. We'll beat people up with the law. We'll kill people with the law. And then there's other people on the other side of the whole thing. It's about grace. Well, it's just about loving each other. Isn't it? Let's just love each other. And they just slathered on so sloppy thick. It just makes you sick, doesn't it? That's right. 
And so Paul writes into this whole thing. He addresses this. So here's a little background. In Romans chapter 13, Romans 13, the beginning of the chapter, he starts talking about obeying civil authorities, obeying the governor of the authorities, your governor, you, you know, the city council, the mayor, the president. And then he talks about paying taxes. You got to pay taxes because people who work for the government, they got to eat too. You know, so he talks about all of these things, civil authority. You can read this on your own. And then, and then he jumps into it with a whole different thought, a whole different thought. He's got a whole different approach to law and grace that just kind of takes us by surprise when he gets into the middle part of Romans chapter 13. Before we get there, I, we're going to talk about the subject of love today. So I need, I need a love expert. So I wonder if there's a love expert in the house today. So how many, is there a love expert? Raise your hand. If you raise your hand, you're an extrovert. We know that right away because no introvert is going to raise their hand to come up here and stand before all these people. How many want to volunteer somebody to be a love expert? Okay. Uh, just, just pinch them and they'll stand right up. Anybody? Anybody here want to be a love expert? Okay, this is, this is great. Okay, come on up here. Here's a love expert. All right, come on, Velo. Come on, your husband. Or should I make, should I make Jesse come? Okay. All right, so this is, this is a question. I'm just going to ask Velo a very simple question, Velo. You know the answer to this. I wouldn't ask you anything that you don't already know, okay? So I just want to know your opinion, all right? Your opinion. What is the opposite of love? Selfishness. Oh, no. Have I talked to you about this before? Nope. Really? Yeah. Go sit down. You get an F in church today. <laughs> you, you just stole my thunder. You just took it all away. Give a hand for Velo. She, did good. she answered right. Velo, you are so brilliant. I can tell that you're a missionary kid. This is awesome. Velo is right on the money. We think naturally that the opposite of love is hate. But let, 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 let's, let's look at that a little bit. All right, so follow along with me. We're in Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Uh, we're we're, we're, we're going to look at verse number 8. And, and he begins at verse number 8. Look, he says, you've got to pay taxes, pay taxes, the whole thing. And then, and then he kind of concludes that thought with, uh, owe nothing to anybody, he says in verse number 8. Owe nothing to anybody. And then, because he didn't have a backspace key, he probably thought, let, 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 me, let me clarify something. Owe nothing to anybody except, except, for your obligation to love one another. <laughs> because if you love your neighbor, you'll fulfill the requirements of the law. Well, how do I do that? I'm so glad you asked. And so is Paul because he answers the question for us. Verse 9, 4. Four. Whenever you see the word four, four means I'm going to explain to you what I just got done saying. Four. Here's the fulfillment. You, you, know, you know the commandments. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Verse 9, 4. The commandments say you must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not covet. These and other such commandments are all summed up in this one commandment, love your neighbor as you love yourself. We, we learned that as a young child regardless of what faith we grew up in, the, the golden rule to just do unto others. So you want it done unto you. Now, let, let, let me ask you this on the whole, the whole love-hate thing. Let me ask you this. Um, Let's get personal here. Committing adultery, you see the commandment right there, not to commit adultery. And let me ask you this. If you've ever committed adultery physically with somebody else, or um, maybe at a website, or in a magazine, or even in a book, who are you thinking about? Were you thinking about the other person? Were you thinking about the exploited and trafficked woman on that website? Were you thinking about your children and your spouse? You were thinking about yourself. Let me ask you this. When, when, when you stole something, you stole something. Oh, the boss isn't going to miss this. They've got tons of inventory and I can walk out with this. And Maybe you stole some hours. You stole something from the boss. You stole uh, maybe from a friend. You stole from a neighbor. Nobody's going to miss this. You, you stole. Who, who were you thinking about when you stole something? Were you thinking about your employer or your friend? Or you were thinking about yourself. Let me ask you this. When you coveted, I want, I want your reputation. I want your money. I want your wife. I want your children. I want your house. I, want, I, I, want, I just want whatever you have. Were, 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 were you thinking about that person? You were thinking a lot about yourself, weren't you? Uh, how many in here have ever murdered somebody before? Raise your hand. Okay, we have police in here. Just Okay, they're scanning the crowd right now. 
How many have ever resented somebody before? <laughs> Were you thinking about the other person and their well-being and their benefits and their welfare and the betterment of their lives when you resented them? Or were you thinking about yourself? So, Velo, you're right. The opposite of love, I think, is selfishness. And that's key, that's key. Because if we can get a grasp of that concept, we're going to understand where the line is drawn between law and grace in any given circumstance when we are challenged in the way we feel around another person. In fact, the Apostle Paul, he's going to write some more about this. Look at verse number 10. He says, look, love does no wrong to others. In other words, love defers to the other person. Love is always thinking about the other person. So, love fulfills the requirements of God's law. It's almost like Paul can read our mind here because he knows knows the struggle and the tension that we have. Love always defers to the other person. And he just gets into our mind when he thinks about stuff. Let me ask you this. How many, how many, just let, let me ask you about married couples because we want to define what love really is because love defers to the other person. All right, so let's just do a, let's just do a very informal poll. This is audience participation today. How many of you, how many of you married couples with a show of hands, the toilet paper should always roll off the top of the roll. Raise your hand, raise your hand. Raise your hand. All right. How many want it the way God puts it on there off the bottom? Raise your hand. How many? Like that. Okay. Because, all right. So now, of all the married couples in here, of all the married couples, how many have a divided household? Raise your hands, right? Okay, because here's what you do. Now, this is, what, this is what the true definition of love is. You're going to be so thankful that you came to church today because if you learn nothing else, this is what love is. Love is this. Men, men, when the toilet paper roll is empty and you put a new one on, Men, you do put a new one on, right? All right, men, you put a new one on. You put the new one on the way your wife wants it on, right? Right? That's called love. Wives, if you put the new toilet paper roll on the toilet paper roll, you put it on there the way I want it on, right? Okay. So, but, all right, that's just the way that whole thing goes. So that's the definition of love. Love is deferring to the other person. It's the opposite of selfishness. Now, it's almost, it's, almost like, it's almost like Paul can read our mind here when he's writing this letter. Because as he's writing this and they're reading through this, love defers to the other person. Yeah, but Paul, you don't know the kind of people I go to church with and you don't know who lives next door to me. Because you know what? They just bug me. Anybody got buggers in their lives, huh? They just bug you. They just, but they just irritate you. You know why they irritate you? Because they don't look like you. They don't listen to your music. They don't eat your food. They don't cheer for your football team. And they don't have the same doctrine in church like you have. They just bug you. Anybody like that? Don't raise your hand. All right. So it's like, it's like Paul, Paul understands this. He's getting into our mind. So then when we get to chapter 14, this is not a change of thought. This is a continuation of where he's going. So he, he, he's talking now very specifically to people that you go to church with, not outside people, not people that are not in church, but people in the church. So this applies just to us today. If you're not a believer or a follower of Jesus Christ, this is a great principle to involve. And we're just going to talk about ourselves for a little bit. So he says in, in verse, one, verse 1, 14, Accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. Okay, what do you mean by that, Paul? Here's what I mean by that. There's people that you go to church with, people that call themselves followers of Christ. They've just got a different idea about stuff in life than you do. It's not biblical matters. There are certain biblical matters that are very black and white. This is about opinion. This is about what you think. This is about how you look at life and certain things in life. They're disputable matters. They're not really that important. Nobody's going to have an eternal destination determined by these lifestyles. It's just a difference of opinion. And we just know that sometimes people have an opinion that's different than ours. And you know what we know about opinions? Everybody, opinions are like armpits. Everybody has at least two and they both stink, right? That's what we know about opinions. All right, so he says, people have different opinions than you do. So what should we do? Verse number two, he goes on, he says, for instance, for instance, one person, I'm glad he said for instance, and he's going to touch on two subjects here. We could, we could have a whole list of things. Oh, pastor, if you knew my neighbor, we could have a list here of for instances, right? So he says, for instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything. He's addressing things that were going on in the church at the time. Uh, but, but another believer with a sensitive conscience eats only vegetables. 
It's a potluck meal after church on a Sunday. Everybody's getting together downstairs, and there's George. George has himself a cow bone, and he's just a gnawing on that cow bone, just enjoying the fact that God made me a carnivore. Hallelujah. And through the corner of his eye, he sees Ethel, and she is enjoying her carrot stick. Okay? And Ethel is thinking, you know what? If he loved Jesus, he'd put down that bone right now and enjoy a carrot with me. And he's thinking to himself, sister, she ain't enlightened yet. She just hasn't discovered the truth. If she knew Jesus, she could eat, she could chaw on a bone just like, just here, I'd break off a piece and give it to her. See, that's kind of what Paul is addressing here. We'll keep going. We'll make it practical. It's fun right now. We'll make it practical in a moment. Verse number three, those who feel free to eat anything, well, they shouldn't look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them both. We're all in church together. God likes the meat eaters and he likes the vegetarians too. And then, and then Paul even moves on a little bit. He says, some people, they started getting caught up in this whole thing about the day of the week. There were some people in the early church that said, you know what? Jesus worshiped on the Sabbath, which was a Saturday. And if Saturday was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. That's what I'm going to worship. And then he had other Christians coming into the church and said, yeah, but Jesus became our Sabbath. He is our Sabbath rest. And he rose again from the dead on a Sunday. So I think we should have church on Sunday. Somebody else came into the church and said, phooey on Saturday and Sunday. I got to work those days. Let's have church on Friday. All right? And so this whole thing started coming. And it really doesn't matter what day of the week we worship Jesus on. I think we should do it seven days a week, right? Okay, there you go. So that's a disputable matter. So Paul goes on to verse number four. Who are you to condemn somebody else's servant? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they, they will stand and receive his approval. So Paul kind of makes it really personal now. He says, look, look, who are you to, look, they're working for Jesus. You're serving Jesus. They're serving Jesus. We're all serving Jesus. You're trying to correct a problem that should not be yours to correct. I would never think of going into your workplace and telling you how you should be serving your boss. Because if I did, we wouldn't be friends very long, would we? Okay. That's what Paul is saying. But you know what we love to do in the church? We love to do this. If people don't think like this, act like us, don't have the same football team as us, man, whatever. They got tattoos and they smoke cigarettes and drink. I mean, Pastor, have you seen their Facebook page? You know what we want to do? Slap the light on the top of the vehicle. Woo! Turn on the siren. We're the police. Let's go get them, Pastor. I mean, isn't that kind of what's within our nature, right? Yeah. How many of you were accused of being a tattletale when you were little? I wasn't. <laughs> now, now, now Paul starts to ask some questions to get really personal in verse 10. Good questions for us to answer, and we, we can only answer these questions. Look at verse 10. Why do you condemn another believer? I don't know. It's a hobby. <laughs> I don't know. I learned it in church. I don't know. He says, why do you look down on another believer? I don't know. It just comes so natural, I guess. It's just so easy. I think I know why I look down on other believers and condemn them. In fact, I could answer the question for you every time because they're not like me. My way is the right way, right? Right? How many would agree with me that my way is the right way? Uh, you're not agreeing with me, all right? I mean, but, but this is the struggle we have. And then he goes on to say in that verse, he says, remember, uh, we all stand before the judgment seat of God. You try to defend your position there. You won't have much to say. He even punctuates that a little bit more in verse 12. He says, yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. Um, it's, isn't it amazing how death is the great equalizer? Before the throne of Jesus, there's no difference in skin color. <laughs> uh, before the throne of Jesus, there's no difference in doctrine. Uh, before the throne of Jesus, there's no way to justify what you think is right and wrong. Because <laughs> Jesus is the truth. And so Paul just kind of brings it into perspective here, doesn't he? And it's a little uncomfortable. And, and then Paul drops this bomb on us about standing before the judgment seat. And we're thinking, well, 
there's a tension I feel when I read this verse. I don't like this tension. So how do I relieve this tension? What do I do? Paul says, I knew you were thinking that. I'm so glad you asked. Here's the answer in verse 13. Let's stop condemning each other. I mean, if you're condemning each other, let's stop it. Let's just stop it. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and to fall. You know what? That's just called love. He says, let's, let's defer to the other person. Wouldn't it be great in Williston, North Dakota, if at the busiest intersection at 2nd Avenue and 26th Street, cars were just backed up forever because everybody was standing outside of their vehicles, motioning to the other vehicles, you first, no, 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 you first, no, you first, no, real, no, come on, you go, no, you go. Wouldn't it be awesome? Uh, okay, it wouldn't be awesome, but you understand what I'm saying, Right? Love just defers to the other person. It's not about my way. It's not about getting what I want. It's about deferring to you and to the church. And then the, Paul, Paul, uh, Paul says in verse number 14, look, and he kind of brings it down to reality in verse 14. Look, I'm, I'm convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat. But if somebody, oh, here you go, believes it is wrong, then for everybody it's wrong. If I think it's wrong, it's wrong for you too. No, he says, look, if somebody believes it's wrong, then for that person, for that person, it's wrong. You know what we call that in the church world? You might hear this in church world kind of dialogue. We call that a personal conviction. And regardless of whether or not you're a follower of Christ, you all have personal convictions. There are certain lines that you draw for yourself that I either will do that or I won't do that. It's just a line that I will not cross. You have your personal convictions. And Paul says, look, you have your personal convictions. That's fine. That's not a problem. But Paul says, you know what? I I don't think this is really even about food or days of the week. I think it's more about attitude than anything else. He goes on to say in verse 15, look, and if another believer is distressed by what you eat, I mean, there you are at the potluck meal, chawing on that bone, mmm, just chawing on that bone, and you look through the corner of your eye, and there's sister whatever, vegetarian down there, and she's enjoying her celery stick, love Jesus. But you see the look on her face, and you see that she's distressed. He says, you know what? You're not acting in love. You know what you're acting in? What's the opposite of love? The selfishness. <laughs> Don't let your eating ruin somebody else for whom Christ died. In fact, that Paul went so far to say that if my habits, my activity would offend somebody and cause them to stumble, I'll never do it again. I, I, I don't know if I love you that much, to be honest with you, church. I'd like to. <laughs> Uh, Verse 16 says, uh, then you will not be criticized for doing something you believe is good. Oh, wait, 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 wait. You mean the tables could be turned? Yeah. I mean, there you are. There you are. Chawing on that big old soup bone at the potluck. You see your sister down there just enjoying her broccoli. Praise Jesus. But you see she's distressed. And so you just go on chawing on your your soup bone. And you just got that bone right up here. And you're just mm, enjoying all that meat. But while you have your arms up there, somebody else is distressed because of you. Because you got your arms upraised. And you know what's on your arms? Pat. Tattoos. Oh, you shouldn't have tattoos if you're a Christian. I will set up the appointment and get them lasered off for you right away, brother. Because if you want to love Jesus, you shouldn't have tattoos. So you see, you, you're distressing somebody else too. <laughs> now, am I preaching against tattoos? No, 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 don't. All right, so don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm just saying that we better be prepared for the tables to turn. If you know that your choices are offensive, don't rub somebody else's nose in your choices. Stop it, because that's called love. It's not about food. It's not about whether or not we should get tattoos. It's not whether or not we should wear makeup and play with cards and all those kinds of things. It's about our attitude towards other people inside the church. That's really what it's all about. Um, It's about harmony and unity and relationship, fellowship in the church. Paul goes on, verse 17. Look, he says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink. Aren't you glad for that? But instead, it's about living a life of 
goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And then he makes this huge statement in verse number 18. If you serve Christ with this attitude of looking for that harmony and peace within the body, you will please God and others will approve of you too. And I think this is where we start to draw the line between law and grace. If we start to live our lives in such a way as I will defer to you because I love you, it's not about me being selfish, it's not about me being right, it's not about me having my rights expressed, it's not about me being on top of the pile all the time, this is about what's best for all of us. This is about how I can live my life in such a way that it's obedient and pleasing to God. And you know what? We don't need rules. We only need rules where there's rebellion. We need rules where there's self-righteousness. We, we, we need law when there's selfishness. But when there's love, well, grace is already expressed when there's love. You know what I love when maybe you've been to a funeral? And um, I, I, I wish somebody would say this about me at my funeral. In fact, if you're here today and you ever attend my funeral, just say it because I asked you to, okay? And you've been to the funeral where you've heard somebody in conversation say, about the deceased, I never heard them say a bad thing about another person. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that an incredible testimony? I hope that's my testimony. And fortunately, everybody at my funeral will be an Alzheimer's person, and they'll forget everything I ever said. And they'll just, what a great guy he was, right? So, verse number 19, so then, here, here, here's what we're supposed to do. Here's, here's what Paul is asking us to do, the so then. Here's what he wants us to do. Aim for harmony. Let that be the goal. Let that be the target that you set up before you. Aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. You're amazing. No, you're amazing. Well, you're amazing -er. Well, you're the amazingest. Well, you're something better than amazing. No, you are. I mean, let's try to build each other. You're an incredible cook. I thank you for that. I mean, you know, no, you're a better cook than I am. You're just awesome the way you serve God. Let's just be honest and sincere with it, but let's try to build one another up. Let's aim for the harmony. When we start to love each other, defer to one another, why do we have to have a line that defines between law and grace. We're drawing the line with the way we love each other and love God. We're drawing the line right there. That's an incredible thing. So uh, verse 21, he says, it's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do, oh, and I love this word, I love this word, anything else. If it might cause another believer to stumble. I mean, I mean, Paul could have gone down the list here. He could have said, look, uh, you shouldn't get tattoos, don't eat meat, make sure that you worship only on Sundays, you should be in assemblies of God because they are the church. I mean, he could just go right down the line, right? But he didn't go down the line. He didn't enumerate things. He didn't list things because he just looks and he said anything. And anything is pretty much everything. <laughs> Yeah, so we can't escape that statement, can we? And he goes on to verse 22. We're almost done. He says, you might believe there's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but keep it between yourself and God. Anybody in this room ever gotten yourself in trouble by opening your mouth and telling everybody what you think is right and what you believe? Yeah, I see one hand. Now's not the time to raise hands. All right, sounds good. Somebody could say, these are not dimples, these are heel marks when I stuck my foot in my mouth so many times, okay? In fact, Paul finishes out the statement because he knows this. Look at the word, blessed, or blessed, however you want to say it. Blessed, happy, fulfilled, at peace are those who don't feel guilty for doing something that they decided is right. Well, why would I feel guilty for doing it? Why would I think, why would, because maybe your actions aren't an expression of love. It's more of an expression of selfishness. And you got yourself in trouble as a result. So Paul finishes out the whole thing really by saying to us that, that selfishness demands the law, but love offers grace. Which do you like better? Now, Paul's got a big conclusion to this whole thought in verse 23. If you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you're sinning. And if we sin, guess what we need? G-R-A-C-E. Um, if you go ahead and do it, for you're not following your own convictions. 
This is a huge statement. I could preach a whole sermon on this one verse. Like, there might not be anything morally or biblically wrong with it, but you believe it's wrong, and when you do it, you're sinning. You've just violated your own convictions. And so Paul finishes out that statement, that thought. He says, if you do, there it is, that word again, anything you believe is not right, you're, you're sinning. Anybody here done anything before? <laughs> I have. I need grace. And uh, here's what I know about myself. If, if I need grace from God, I should be willing to offer grace to you. Um, let me put one last slide up here with just a thought. That salvation, excuse me, that selfishness, selfishness demands law. If I'm going to be selfish... If I'm going to be selfish, I need the law. Because if you had no law, if, look how selfish humanity is today. And I remember being a kid thinking, why do we have to have laws? Tell my parents, well, if I was the president, we wouldn't have any rules. I hate rules. Anybody ever been through that phase? Or was I the only one? I mean, I was 13. I pretty much was brilliant, you know. And if you don't have rules and laws, you have anarchy, <laughs> Because people are selfish. But where people defer to one another and love each other, love just offers grace. So where does this land on us today? Well, I, I think there's a few places we could go with this. I, I know the kind of home you might have grown up in. Um, that there was never love. It was always law. In fact, every time dad raised his hand, you uh, weren't sure if it was to scratch the back of his head or to slap you. Seriously. And then uh, somebody told you about Jesus. Maybe even you grew up in the church then and you were trying to transcribe this thing about your dad and the way he treats you or mom and the way mom treats you into this relationship with a loving God who loves you. You really struggled with that thing. So, you know what? You love Jesus today. You're in a relationship with Him. You have fellowship with God. But, boy, you just find your heart leaning really heavy towards law. And there's just something inside of you that just wants to correct what needs to be corrected in everybody. And you hate it. You hate it. And you say to yourself, why am I like this? And I struggled with the same thing. Look, I, I, I know we might go long today. I, I was working for my wife. She was my boss at Bonanza. We were cooking. I was cooking. I was on the line where all the food was prepared. One of the rules of the line was this. You don't eat the food that you're cooking. I mean, it's just common sense. It was a slow time in the afternoon, and there was a basket of French fries there. And I remember, I think the girl's name even was Don. Don reached into the fryer basket, and she grabbed a French fry, and she took a bite, and I reached it right out of her fingers, and I said, you're not supposed to eat on the line, and I threw it in the garbage can. What a jerk. Go ahead, say it, right? What a jerk. Aren't you glad you didn't work with me? To which Don did what Don did. <laughs> she just goes off crying, I think, you know? Then this smart, whippy little blonde named Robin called me into the office and said, you don't have authority to do that. I was so mad at you because you were so right. <laughs> and I don't know what it was in me that thought I had to be right. We carry that into church sometimes too, don't we? You see the dress she wore? You see the tattoos? Did you see their Facebook page? Pastor, you need to do something about that. Because if you don't, I will. I'm just telling you. Lord, help us just love people the way you loved us. Because when we start to love the right way, we don't have to worry about where the line is between law and grace. You never have to worry about it. When you just start to love God and love people. Love God and love people. Just love God and love people. Yeah, there's things that are biblical, definitely they're biblically wrong and we can't do them. Because God has some standards about the value of human life. 
There's some moral things that are very clear and defined for us in Scripture. Those are non-debatable. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about the things that are just like, yeah, well, you know. <laughs> Remember the first time I asked my mom if I could wear jeans to church? She looked at me like I just told her I was the Antichrist. <laughs> you know? And so people still today, well, what, what, can, what should I wear to church? Can I wear jeans? You know? Look, worshiping Jesus is not a matter of wearing jeans or dresses. I want to give God my best, okay? But I want to bring a right heart in here. Well, pastor, what do you think about getting tattoos? I don't care. You know, we, we just get so bent on some things because we, want to, we just want to meet out the law all the time. And then there's other times we just swing the pendulum the other way. Well, we just, as long as we just love them, just love, as long as they love each other, it really doesn't matter. We swing the pendulum too far the other way. But if we love biblically, a little bit the way Paul talks about here. We don't have to worry about the line between law and grace. We're drawing it as we go because we're loving people and God the right way. 